Today we'll look at Defence Against Infectious Disease as part of our revision. So the first thing to look at is what prevents pathogens from getting into your body. Um, and a pathogen, if you can't remember, is just anything that sort of causes an infectious disease. But it can be something living here, like these microbes um, can inc include things like bacteria, which are um, prokaryotes, but also things like um, protozoans as well and other little parasites and fungi. And then things like our viruses or our prions over here, which are even smaller, just little sort of protein fragments. Um, are not considered living, but all of them together um, are disease-causing agents in an infectious form. So that's what we're looking at fighting here. Now, the main thing um, that stops you getting infected with something is that you have a continuous layer of tissue on the outside of your body, which is your skin. Um, and it's quite tough because the a sort of outer layer of your skin actually has dead cells on it, um, and they tend to be a bit more keratinized, which just gives it sort of physically some toughness. Um, and your skin's usually dry. You have a bit of oil from your sebaceous glands, and they can have some other components in them as well. But in terms of water content um, at the surface of your skin, it's usually quite dry. Unless you get folds of your skin, like, for example, if people don't dry between their toes and they get um, sleep foot, which is a fungus. Um, so having most of your skin is normally, in normal circumstances, being quite dry. Um, so growth of these microbes here, um, the living component that otherwise need moisture to survive. And then um, you've also got some mucous membranes in the part of your body that are sort of entry points. For example, in your mouth, you've got an entry point to a digestive system there. So, um, and as well, your lungs. So these are all lines with um, key things you talk about the spelling of a mucous membrane, um, O-U-S. The, the adjective, the submembrane, and then mucus here without the O is the noun of the product um, that's made. So um, these are sort of thinner parts of skin that don't have that sort of tough dead layer on the outside, um, but instead they produce a sticky mucus which helps to trap any pathogens, any dust or invaders that's coming in. Um, and some of them, things like your your lungs and your nose, for example, um, or the linings that are going down your skin have little cilia which are little tiny hairs to help just move that um, mucus back up and out so that any pathogens they contain um, are swept back out again and you get rid of them. Um, now, both of these are a barrier, but, of course, we have pathogens in your um, skin. Now, both of them tend to be fairly low in pH, so you secrete some fatty acids and some lactic acid um, in your skin and mucous membranes which brings the pH down to a point where it kills some of the microbes that would otherwise attack. And you've also got existing what we tend to call flora, um, which is a natural sort of composition of other microbes that live um, on your body and that don't cause you any harm. And it's quite useful to have them there because then they help compete for the bad ones. So they're competing for space, which keep out the pathogenic, um, pathogenic microbes as well. And the other thing is this lysosome. A lysozyme here, which is an enzyme that um, damages your um, any bacteria that are invading, and that's present in a lot of the So that means they come out onto your skin and even in the mucus itself. So lysozyme is there, and it's um, sort of a group of enzymes that attack the, um, the carbohydrate in the cell walls of bacteria and the peptidoglycans, which is the protein carbohydrate um, unit make up a cell wall um, and that's specific to bacteria so that's one way that your body is helping to break possibly enter now if you do break your skin so you get a cut or something um, you need to seal that as fast as you can to prevent entry of pathogens and also to prevent um, exit of your blood so the part the component of your blood that does this is your platelets so they're little fragments of cells. So you see this here like in yellow. Um, they're not whole cells. They're just little sort of components. So they don't have a cell nucleus or anything like that. But they do really supporting factors. Now, um, what you get then is a whole cascade of reactions. And it's all um, a lot of proteins. And the cascade just means sort of like a reaction. One thing reacts, causes the next step. Um, and the key steps that you need to worry about here yeah, are this conversion of um, proteins. The thrombin is an enzyme, and we use this to 
pro at the start for um, forms of enzymes that are inactive. So we also see it, for example, um, in the digestive system in the stomach so that the enzymes that are released don't just digest the cells that they're made in. Um, and then we see here that this fibrinogen is a um, structural protein. And that goes from being globular, has a sort of hydrophilic regions on the outside that keeps it soluble, to an insoluble fibrous form here, which is the fibrin. So it goes from being able to travel dissolved in your blood to here making a big kind of mesh. I'm just going to emphasize these bits over here. And that's going to trap extra blood cells and platelets in place so that it's going to form a clot. So that's the process of clotting, or we can also do regulation. Um, and it traps, it traps those things, make physical blockage until um, new cells can be constructed here to repair the tissue. And if that's exposed to air, so that's on the outside of your body, on your skin, um, it will form a scab. But you also see you get um, clots and repair happening underneath the skin as well, other parts. Or if you've ever had ever had a bruise, who hasn't? Um, that's just some breaking the tissue, but not the top layer of skin. So that dark colour comes from the blood there and it, it has to break down over time. Um, this showing too that you get these sort of coarse with fibers in this fibrin mesh. So this is an electron micrograph of some blood cells caught in some um, fibrin. And of course, that's coloured to make it more visible. That's not the actual colour. Um, if you're interested as well, like this coagulation, anything that um, a chemical that prevents the process of co coagulation is called an anticoagulant um, or blood thinners. So if you've heard of warfarin and heparin before, they have quite diverse uses for poison. Even um, dialysis equipment, if you're having your blood filtered, if you have kidney failure, um, you need to stop your blood from clotting in the machine or even things like the saliva of leeches or even mosquito bites. So it, leeches have um, have a chemical here in it actually, which is the most potent natural inhibitor of this thrombin. So um, this is an enzyme, um, as we mentioned, and it's an inhibitor of this enzyme. So it stops the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, which is helping the leech to, um, to have a feed. <laughs> Um, they also have other anaesthetics and vasodilators in their saliva as well, a whole mixture of things that help them to take blood from you without you noticing and without it clotting. Now, clotting itself, um, it's a good thing when you want your tissues repaired, but it can be problematic at other times. So if you have coronary artery disease, and that is something, coronary artery disease is really a major theme in your course. It pops up in the topic about looking at lipids for example like what's in the diet it pops up um, just generally about the blood system and coronary arteries pops up in option d when talking about both nutrition and the structure of the heart so it really is um, a common theme or something that's applied in those blood analysis times. Um, things like you should know what the factors are things like having those high density lipids the different um, proportions of what you eat and things like hypertension, having high blood pressure and not exercising or smoking and those sorts of things. And it's one of those things that pops up as a question about correlation versus causation because we don't know for sure if any of these things directly lead to coronary artery disease, um, but they are um, correlated. So they're considered risk factors and things that you should avoid. One thing that hasn't been shown to have a good correlation is actually the amount of dietary cholesterol you eat. That doesn't seem to have much impact on your blood cholesterol. But anyway, here, um, I've put a whole lot of medical terms over here, like quite a lot. You don't need to know these, um, but you might see them when you're doing reading or you might be a bit confused or if you're watching a television show and wanting to know what they're about. Um, what we're looking at here, one thing you do need though, is like the atherosclerosis. That's that hardening of your arteries because of those fatty and like high cholesterol deposits. So here, we're talking about like the development of a plaque in an artery and we're talking specifically about a coronary artery, which is an artery that supplies the heart muscle with oxygen. So it's coming straight off the aorta. But um, you might be thinking, well, of course the heart has blood in it. But blood passing through also still needs to be delivered around the outside to the muscle itself. So if we have a coronary artery here um, and you have fatty deposits because of some of these risk factors perhaps, um, part of that might rupture and form a little clot here and actually block the artery. Um, which obviously you don't want to have because then you have tissue death here. Um, and you, so myocardial infarction here is another word 
um, more medical terminology for a heart attack because you've got tissue death or um, ischemia here also um, that restriction of blood supply to a tissue is what's happening. So don't worry too much about these words, but just if you hear them or see them, um, this is what's happening. What you need to know here is that it's an example of where this process of clotting is happening, um, but that it becomes problematic because of the location and because of the narrowing of these blood vessels due to these fatty deposits. Um, and there's the rupture of the actual deposit itself. Like that's what's causing then the body's trying to repair this bit of tissue by forming a clot. Um, and that, of course, if we have some tissue death, might lead to some problems with the heart pumping as well, particularly major tissue death, and then the whole body is not getting enough bit of heart tissue. All right, if we look at some of the other lines of defence then, so a pathogen might have um, got into the body, they've put that the skin and mucous membranes as a barrier and then clotting to sort of maintain that barrier, but sometimes do cross into the bloodstream. Um, we have non-specific defences first. So things we need to focus on phagocytes here, that's the word you need to know. Um, they can be broken into further groups, but it's not expected that you know those words. But you should know that they are a type of white blood cell or a leukocyte. That's what a leukocyte is, a white, white blood cell. And they're actually, like as you can see here, a whole lot of different types. Um, but we're not, your course doesn't go into detail about every single cell type. What these guys do, though, is they tend to detect anything that's invading. So anything on the surface of the little bacterium that's coming in will help. These cells will be able to recognise that it's foreign or non-self, um, and they will engulf them. So these are the ones that kind of look like a little pacman or have an amoeboid motion of extending parts of the cell around until they have engulfed it. So it's a process of um, phagocytosis or endocytosis. So they're sort of forming a little vesicle within here, which is called this phagosome here. And that will generally fuse with a lysosome, which is a little vesicle just filled with digestive enzymes and things that are going to break down that pathogen and help kill it. It won't always work, but it does a lot of the time, which is really good. Um, but sometimes then we need to go to some other forms of defence when we get to the specific types. Um, but there's a lot of toing and froing with the immune system. So we might have some of these non-specific cells sort of engulfing a pathogen um, and they might actually help present the antigen to things that are going to make antibodies or vice versa. You can have sometimes and the antibodies might actually just help disable these pathogens so that these big cells here can come and clean them up and kind of engulf them. There's a lot of toing and froing with our um, immune system, lots of double ups and different pathways that things can take. But it's important to realise that these ones are called phagocytes and the, the phago part, or you might see like phage, bacteriophage, or um, even in talking about sort of trophic levels and things and um, I see that word for, for eating or feeding. So we've got that, they're the ones that do that engulfing of invading cells. Um, if you're interested, by the way, I've just put a picture to show you that, like these examples, like that's a neutrophil here and the macrophage there, just as examples of types. Um, and again, you don't need to know these words, but you might just be interested. Like these are some of the really short lived ones here, the neutrophils. They tend to be the first on the scene. They're really mobile, they go around in your bloodstream. Um, they can get through those um, little gaps in your cells and in interstitial fluid. So they tend to be like your first aid. They turn up as soon as you've got an injury and they tend to increase inflammation. And these sort of bigger ones, macrophages, the macro means they're large, um, they produce a lot of signaling molecules and a bit of positive feedback for the inflammation and um, triggering then those cells that are going to make antibodies, which are the ones that give you a specific response. They can also, just if you're curious too, like these neutrophils tend to be the ones that die off if you they get attacked by bacteria and make pus. And then the macrophages have to come come along and um, clean them up as well. Now, if we go into the specific things, this is where we talk about um, our anti antibodies, which respond to antigens, and that's actually where the word antigen comes from because it's an antibody generator. So it triggers a specific response, and this is the kind of thing we're targeting with vaccinations as well, introducing antigens into your body so that your body has time to have some trial and error with mutations and testing out different antibodies until it finds one that works. 
um, and then keeping a memory of with those cells to produce those antibodies should you be exposed to that antigen again. So um, here we're talking about lymphocytes. This is the name of the cell, specifically B lymphocytes. There are actually T lymphocytes as well, which is in the high-level course. Um, but here we're just focusing on the B ones. Maybe think B and B if that helps. Um, so they're the cells that are going to make antibodies in response to a particular molecule in the surface of a pathogen that enters your body. And they have to fit together really specifically. So you can see here it's a bit like the substrate enzyme model that they need, like active site here. Um, and this is the part two, this little antigen binding site that's really, really highly variable. So high um, rate of sort of different gene products here to make, go through this trial and error process of creating um, different, different polypeptides in this binding site so that you can find a match for any possible antigen that enters your body. Um, so you've got a lot of these cells then, a lot of these B lymphocytes. Um, and they're all trying to present lots of different new antibodies when you're infected with something. Um, and when a match is found, so when there is a fit between an antigen and an antibody, um, your B cells are triggered to divide, the one's the correct one. And we call this a type of selection, just like natural selection, um, that you know, there's, a, there's a response because the antigen fits the antibody. There's a response that triggers that cell to uh, undergo mitosis which means it's cloning itself, so that's why it's called clonal selection. So it will make copies of the same cell so that it can produce the right antibody to fight the infection. Now, most of them will be, co will be called plasma cells, which means they move about in your bloodstream and they're little factories for these antibodies. But a small proportion of them hang around as memory cells. So these ones, the plasma ones, are fairly short-lived. Uh, and then your antibody factories and then mem memory cells are ones that hang about so that if you're exposed to the same pathogen again, you should be able to mount an attack before you really start to get any symptoms so that you don't become sick. And that's, again, that thing with vaccines, um, you're hoping to shortcut, not have that first infection, but just have a first exposure to a weakened form of the pathogen or just a piece of the antibody, then your body can recognise it if you are exposed to it. Um, and we mentioned before, too, that how antibodies work, well, they might just inactivate the, the pathogen or they might help with some recognition. It's one of those pathogens that they get back to come along and just wear it more easily if it's, if it's sort of tagged in antibodies. There's a few different mechanisms at play. All you really need to know, though, is the name of these B lymphocytes. They make antibodies, but they're specific to antigens and this clonal selection idea, and then plasma cells and memory cells. And just to give you that overview as well here, you see these memory cells, they have this antigen expressed on the surface, so it's antibody. So if they encounter the antigen, they're triggered to divide again, um, whereas the plasma cells are producing antibodies that they're sending out into the bloodstream and some of that fluid around the, t the cells and the tissue where it's needed. Now, this one here, you don't need to know details about the helper T cell, but it is something that helps this uh, process of clonal selection with the B cells. By the way, when it says B cell or T cell, that's synonymous with B lymphocyte and T lymphocyte. Now, where that does come into play, though, is understanding a little bit about HIV. Now, again, I said you don't have to worry about the uh, details of what the lymphocytes do, but they are the target of attack by HIV. So HIV is an immunodeficiency virus. It's a type of retrovirus, which just means retro, if we talk about like retro music or going back in time, um, that is able to kind of back transcribe its, its genetic material. So it's actually got RNA in here. Um, and when it enters into the host cell, because remembering that viruses don't uh, have their own metabolic processes, so they need a host to make more copies of themselves and divide, um, they're actually able to get their RNA sort of copied back the other way and inserted into the DNA of their host, which is sort of then your host cells, like your own cells, will divide and keep copying this viral genetics that will stay in there in your cells. 
Um, so in the early stages of having uh, an HIV infection, you'll still be able to produce antibodies and your body will be trying to fight little antigens on the surface here. So you'll make some antibodies and you would HIV positive. But over a period of years, usually for most people, coming up to a sort of decade, uh, the T lymphocytes, these helper cells, are being attacked and they're all incorporating this HIV genetics into their DNA, um, which means that the protection that the T lymphocytes provide is lost. And then also the fact that those lymphocytes, these T1 helper cells, we saw sort of on the previous page, back here, they kind of help with this clonal selection, also means that your ability to produce antibodies is impaired. So we have less activation of the lymphocytes, which is quite important because then not only we've sort of got two pathways of our immune system shut down, the T lymphocytes aren't really working and they're also not able to help the lymphocytes. That means opportunistic infections, things like just a little cold or things that we really don't see in most other people because our bodies are usually very good at fighting them off, um, they tend to crop up. And we would say that somebody has AIDS, like the full-blown syndrome, when they're um, developing quite significant infections. So um, for most people, sadly, if they um, die because of AIDS, it's not the HIV virus that's caused that. It's the HIV virus has stopped them being able to respond to another infection. So a smaller, milder infection would actually be quite significant in somebody who can't effectively produce antibodies. Now, the way that HIV pass from person to person, a um, few different ways, but mostly anywhere where you would have to stand on your blood. It's not a particularly hardy virus. It doesn't, it's not spreading droplets like um, sort of coughing like a cold and it's not, um, doesn't survive on surfaces particularly long, but where you have blood contact is tends to be where HIV is passed on. So it could be through sexual intercourse with small tears to be membranes allows entry into the bloodstream um, or things like, for example, blood transfusions where they haven't been screened um, or even just products like this factor eight, for example, is a clotting factor that can be sort of purified from blood products and may still be contaminated. And of course, if you share needles, hypodermic just means below the skin. There's something that enters the bloodstream. If you, bloodstream, if you share needles with somebody, which tends to be quite problematic with um, illicit substances, so with drug taking, where people perhaps are not being as cautious about their use of things. Whereas if you went into a hospital setting, you'd be having all sterile equipment and new needles for each patient or each, each use. Next, we'll look at antibiotics. So these are things that block um, cellular processes or metabolic processes that are occurring in bacteria. So antibiotics are specific bacteria. If you're after something else, like if you have a fungal infection, you, you would take an antifungal um, or something more generally that it targets a lot of things is called an antimicrobial, but antibiotics are prokaryotes. Um, and that means that if they're targeting prokaryotic cell processes, for example, the construction of a bacterial cell wall, they're not going to affect your cells. So you're quite safe to take those most instances, unless perhaps you had an allergy. Um, and antibiotics are natural in origin. So, for example, the one that is mentioned by a syllabus in the classic penicillin, the first one that was discovered, um, is from the penicillium fungus. So that's a genus of fungus uh, and it's a mould um, that competes naturally with bacteria in the environment. So it has evolved to have um, a chemical sort of attack mechanism to make space for itself uh, in its ecosystem. So there are different things that antibiotics target. But they might be sort of at a genetic level, or like you mentioned, that cell wall or something, um, or even at level of protein synthesis, things like that. But they're something in a metabolic pathway, um, which you know is going to happen because bacteria have their own metabolic pathways. So if someone ever told you to take an antibiotic for a cold or the flu, it's not going to work. And this is a really common exam question, only worth one or two marks, but it might be something about outline. Um, the use or misuse of antibiotics, viruses, or their effectiveness on bacteria versus viruses. 
Um, viruses, as we can see here, this is an example of bacteriophage. Um, here's a little virus infecting a bacterial host, adds its own DNA in, and then the bacteria will produce the new viruses. Um, and it might break, it might lies, or it might just um, send out the new viruses here. But either way, the machinery, if you like, or the factory for making new products is the host cell. So to attack a virus, you cannot target a metabolic process of the virus because it doesn't have any. So instead, you know, antiviral drugs work quite differently, or they perhaps disable that virus from infecting the cell in the first place. So that's um, that's not an emphasis on how antivirals work. What you do need to know, though, is that antibiotics definitely do not work on viruses. The other thing that crops up and crosses over with topic 5.2 about natural selection is that antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So we can, we do see now um, an, it's an increasingly a problem in our hospitals um, and generally in our population is that by taking more and more antibiotics, we are changing the natural selection pathway for a lot of bacteria. So they might have, you know, those things like in a plasmid, they might have an extra gene that perhaps gives them an alternative pathway for something they can make. So depending on what the antibiotic targets, but they might have a different enzyme they use or a different structural protein or something. Um, that they can make that will give them some protection. Now, the key point here is that antibiotics don't cause bacteria to become resistant. The uh, resistance has to be pre-existing, must be there already. So in the um, pool of bacteria that were already there, some of them have to already have a natural resistance to the antibiotic. But because we are changing how much of that antibiotic is applied, or how much that pressure in the environment, we are selecting for the ones that are resistant. We are killing off any other competitive bacteria um, that aren't resistant. So the proportion, the frequency of alleles changes. And th thinking back to our definition of evolution, that's what evolution is. We're changing the proportion of particular forms of genes, the alleles, over time, over generations. So now we're finding that, that our populations of bacteria are mostly resistant to a lot of antibiotics, which is a real problem if people are over-prescribing them because we're unnecessarily exposing bacteria to antibiotics. So again, that thing of not using them if you have a cold. Now the research on antibiotics, um, early days sort of going back to when he discovered penicillin and that's him down here. Um, with his little agar plates here and that got infected with a mould. So it was a sort of another example of a serendipitous discovery, one of those kind of accidental things you often see in science, um, that inhibited growth of bacteria. And then Flory and Chain here sort of ran with that and developed um, some further experiments to see if that could be used then um, in treatment. And how it was quite, they, I mean, they developed this, technique for culturing the mould, um, but it took about 2,000 litres, I think, of the kind of cold uh, culture fluid, like the mould juice, if you like, to make enough penicillin to just treat one small case of sepsis, um, which is infection in the blood. Um, so, you know, there were other people as well. These guys get the credit, but there are other people who also then went on to discover different species in the penicillium genus that had higher Sort of amounts or concentrations um, and then there were also they were genetically manipulated to be able to produce more as well but it really came into um, prevalence in sort of the second world war and the ability to treat people from for their infections from their wounds was really quite an amazing groundbreaking thing because actually it wasn't so much the wounds themselves that caused a lot of mortality it was really from the secondary infections but then that um, Florian Chain carried out. Um, apparently, they only used eight mice and they gave them all an infection with the Streptococcus bacterium and then gave half of them, treated them with penicillin. And they saw a very clear cut 100% survival with penicillin and none without it. So, they had, you know, we could look at that from kind of a nature of science point of view and say, look, well, that control group was really important in making sure that was valid and knowing that the penicillin was the causal factor there and the difference. 
Otherwise, if they'd all had penicillin, perhaps the bacteria hadn't been lethal enough. Um, and then they would took that after that file. It was only very small, though. We would, we would look at that now by today's standards and think that that's a really insufficient amount of trialling before you test it on a human. But they did then, um, there was a policeman who had an infected cut. I think it was like a rose thorn on his face or something that just sort of freakishly got infected. Um, and they tried to save him, but they actually ran out of penicillin. I think after a couple of days of seeing some improvement, they didn't have enough to continue treatment. So we would sort of consider that the ethics of starting treatment today is with the inability to follow that through. So if we're looking at sort of a critiquing that, um, but not all that long after that, they were able to test the penicillin on five more patients and they were all um, successful at getting rid of that infection. So they certainly had otherwise um, a very good strike rate for seeing that the penicillin was active and effective. Um, to sort of sum up at the end of this topic, I think there's a really good crossover with topic two and the part about proteins. And I've seen exam questions before that sort of ask specifically about this. So we can see here that in our defence against disease, proteins really are key because we've got structural proteins in our skin, things like the collagen that holds them together, and it's protein that's put a bit together, um, give you that barrier. And then lysozyme is that digestive enzyme that helps break down bacterial cell walls as well. That's the one that's in your sweat and tears and things. And then we can see too that once things cross into the blood, um, we have or to prevent them getting further, blood clotting also comes down to proteins. So that thrombin from prothrombin is that enzyme that does the conversion and then we go from fibrinogen fibrin from globular to a fibrous protein that makes the mesh so that we get a clot or a scab. Um, and that helps repair tissues and prevent entry of pathogens or even then from recognition. So knowing if your something is self or non-self, um, we have things you don't have to worry about really complex. We have markers on our own cells so that we know not to attack them. Whereas something on somebody else's cells, it could be another person with a transplant or an invading pathogen and bacteria, it could be a virus, um, it could be a protozoan, but they will have markers on the outside of their cells or um, capsids that are antibody generating, remembering where that name came from. So something that our cell, our body doesn't recognise and panics and goes attack, attack. So proteins are really important in that recognition process. They're also important for signalling. Again, these are words that you might see but you don't need to know, like interleukins, but um, our immune system, the cells of our immune system, different types of white blood cells have to signal to each other. So there are chemical messengers that are sent in the blood that tell more white blood cells to come to the right spot or, you know, to trigger then the clonal selection of our B lymphocytes. So signalling also comes down to proteins that are used as chemical messengers. And then, of course, we have um, our phagocytes. Oh, I apologise. Our phagocytes are the ones like our neutrophils and macrophages. They are ones, our Pac-Man, um, that are not specific to one type of pathogen, but any pathogen they encounter, they will try to engulf and digest with those, with those digestive enzymes to break them up. Um, and that's the lysosome, which is the vesicle inside merging with that. And then we have the specific defence, antibodies. They're made of proteins, and the name of those proteins is called immunoglobins, um, and they're made by your B lymphocytes to target a specific pathogen. So an, one antibody matched to one antigen. So, of course, we have a lot of variability in those proteins as well. And that sums up.